Okay, welcome everyone. This is Victor Garlington with 70 cents a gallon. I want to say thank you again for taking some of your precious time to join us on a great conversation that we're going to have this evening on creating algal, or algae biofuel, or actually algal oil. Tonight's speaker we have is Mr. Bill Gears. He is a biofuels pioneer, and I don't say that lightly. He is a great inventor. I've known him now for five years, and he makes really great equipment. His latest and greatest adventure right now is into the algal oil world. Bill, are you there? I sure am, Victor. Fantastic. Well, Bill, at this time, I'm going to go ahead, before you get started, I'm going to go ahead and set a couple of ground rules for everybody. So please, anyone and everyone, if you have dogs, cats, children, or other noisemakers in the background, please mute your phone. The call will be muted as far as everyone else except the speakers, and then we'll have Q&A questions on the back end. So feel free to save those questions for the last 15 minutes of the call, and we'll get to them, I promise. Bill, well, go ahead and give us a little bit of history and tell everyone about yourself. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm the owner of Florida Biodiesel Inc. And we have been producing biodiesel production equipment since 2006. Uh, last year, we started the uh, LG Biofuel Research Center and have been working with uh, Nanocoraptus Oclata uh, and have also been experimenting with uh, producing a line of uh, Nanocoraptus with fire uh, limpid. Uh, production. Okay. Bill, can you kind of explain how you made the switch to the Algal Research Center and what prompted you to do so? Were there any industry factors? Sure. One of the things that were the, that appear to be the limiting factor for biodiesel production is uh, the lack of a suitable feedstock. And LG uh, is up to 50% oil content. And uh, due, to, due to the high limpid content, it makes it very easy to work with LG. It doubles its density every seven days. And uh, uh, that is one of the highest uh, oil producing uh, items that there is. So when you talk about producing algal oil, I mean, that comes, a lot of things come to mind. We're talking about biofuels. We're talking about nutraceuticals, petroceuticals. What sort of markets can one expect to find profits in within the algal oil industry? Can you kind of name some of the industries that you were kind of looking at, Bill? Sure. It's what you're looking at is uh, for the biofuel industry, uh, the nanocoropsis uh, algae uh, pr uh, produces uh, uh, the oil for biodiesel production. Uh, you also have uh, the waste glycerin from biodiesel production that you can use as a food source for the algae cryptocodinium uh, that produces DHA uh, oil. And DHA oil is a nutraceutical that is currently selling for approximately $500 a gallon. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? I think you stuttered. Okay. <laughs> the uh, the Was nutraceutical... That a gallon? That, that's like black gold, Texas tea. Was that the Beverly Hills Billy e show? Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's, which is what uh, the biodiesel production... Uh, or producers are able to do is take the uh, is take the uh, uh, waste glycerin, treat it to neutralize any uh, uh, any methanol or any caustic agent that might be in it, and you're actually using it as a food source for the cryptocodinium algae. And uh, uh, once again, that algae. Is a is a high value omega three uh, oil that is currently going for about five hundred dollars a gallon. Wow, that's very exciting. You know, 
here at 70 cents a gallon in Florida Biodiesel, you know, we're all about the fuel making our country stronger with, you know, independent fuel. But as Bill just mentioned, there's a tremendous opportunity outside of the fuels industry, nutraceuticals, petroceuticals, and the list goes on. Can you talk a little bit more about the omega-3 value? Maybe not everyone understands what that is, Bill. Sure. Omega-3 oils are the... Uh, are the uh, the helpful oils that all our physicians are telling us that we need to take the fish oil uh, primarily is what they're talking about and uh, the fish get the uh, omega-3 oils from the smaller fish that they eat and the smaller fish get their omega-3s from the algae and uh, is what you're looking at is the, uh, when you are uh, working with the uh, algae oil directly from the algae, you no longer have the heavy metal or the uh, other pollutants uh, that are in the fish oils, which are which are uh, much more helpful. You're you're going directly to the source of the omega threes with algae. Well, fantastic. Well, can you provide some initial concept for the algae growth? I mean. Let's just start with someone who may have a burning desire to create a business growing algal oil. How mm -hmm. should they get started, Bill? Well, is what you're looking at is starting from the beginning. Uh, algae is rated by how much oil it will make per cubic meter of uh, media. Media is defined as the growth, uh, the growth uh, uh, solution that the algae is is grown in. A cubic meter is three foot by three foot by three foot, and uh, uh, nanochloropsis oil, the standard algae produces one half of a liter per cubic meter of oil. Okay. So let's talk about the type of equipment one will need. Uh, can I do it in my house? Can I do it? Do I need an industrial parkway? Is it something I can get started in my garage? I mean, what do you recommend to get started, whether you're a businessman or an independent operator? Sure. If you're looking at producing uh, algae oil for biodiesel production, you are looking at uh, uh, a large operation which would include uh, raceway ponds. Uh, generally, uh, it is a, uh, a flow that is uh, 360 degrees with a separator in the center. Uh, uh, the amount of, of algae uh, media that I've, I've given would determine uh, the amount of uh, uh, volume required. Yeah, for, for the given amount of algae that, that wants to be produced. Uh, the the uh, cryptopodinium algae that is made from the uh, waste of the biodiesel is, uh, is an algae that requires no light. That is actually fermented much like beer is fermented. And it's all you have to do is make sure that the pH is correct and uh, uh, the salinity is correct, and there is no light required. It's just glycerin from the uh, waste of the biodiesel and uh, uh, heat, and that's, that, that is required. Uh, now, as far as how large the, the uh, raceway ponds need to be for the nanochloropsis, uh, you are looking at the average uh, raceway pond being some, somewhere around 100 to 120 foot in, di in length, and the, pond, the raceway ponds are approximately six foot uh, wide, each channel being three foot. Okay. Well, what do you think about the concept of utilizing a bioreactor, like you mentioned, with fermentation rather than a raceway pond? You know, some people don't have access to maybe lots of land, but they may have access to a warehouse, a garage, or other. Uh, is there a preference that you have between a photobioreactor or just a raceway pond? 
the volume of media that is required to produce the correct amount of uh, of uh, of oil uh, mandates that the for the for actual feedstock for biodiesel you have to be outside with the raceway ponds. That's the only way that you're going to be able to create the volume necessary for biodiesel production. Right. Uh, as far as uh, using glycerin to make the high value DHA oil, that can be done in vertical uh, uh, bioreactors indoors. Well, you see a lot of big players, you know, Alpha oil production for biofuels has been up and down in the last five years. But you see a lot of the big players going into the higher value production for their investors, I assume. And a lot of that lies within the nutraceutical, petroceutical, pharmaceutical industries. So Correct. would you think that it would be an easier, less problematic business to produce alpha oil for those higher value industries? or do you feel that it would be just as easy to produce those types of volumes needed for biofuel production using alga oil, of course? Mm -hmm. Well, is what you're looking at is the high-value uh, algae oil uh, market is indeed the the uh, DHA oil, uh, which is go currently going for approximately $500 a gallon. You also have the estazanthin, and uh, yeah, that is the uh, highest value uh, algae oil that is made from the Homo uh, uh algae, and that is actually a freshwater algae. Uh, that oil is going somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars a gallon, and uh, uh, that is approximately six hundred times uh, more and or. Um, Oh gosh, uh, the uh, it, it is 600 times more powerful than vitamin C and 1600 times more powerful uh, than vitamin E as an antioxidant. Okay. As a matter of fact, the astaxanthin, uh, when you when everyone thinks of flamingos and the related spoonbill birds, where they get their pink from the from the uh, 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 food that they eat, they're actually right. getting the astaxanthin uh, naturally from the shrimp and the crabs that they eat. Very same thing. This is whatever makes the shrimp turn pink when you eat it, that's astaxanthin right there. Okay, so that happens with the flamingos as well, you're saying? That's right. Okay, so let's go back to I want to go ahead and start a business creating algal oil. How do I get started? I mean, where do I find the algal strains? Do, you know, do I buy them from uh, a person like yourself, or what do I? How do I get started with that? There are many uh, laboratories that carry uh, algae uh, cultures. Uh, uh, our algae biofuel research center also carries uh, the same cultures at the same price that that the other laboratories do. Uh, the 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 first thing to to determine is is uh, how you want the how you how do you want to fit in with the LG? Uh, do you want to produce LG for biofuel? Do you want to uh, use the glycerin uh, waste by byproduct from LG to produce the high value uh, DHA oil, or do you want to produce LG uh, for astaxanthin production? Uh, yeah. yeah they're, they're all different species of algae, and each gotcha. one uh, is, is different, has its own growing characteristics, but it's nothing that uh, uh, it's nothing that can't be accomplished. It's very easy to grow algae. So basically, once the entrepreneur has the business plan on which market they're going to go for, then that will determine the type of either raceway pond, bioreactor, or fermentation tank they need to create that type of oil? That is, that is correct. Uh, 
uh, a very good mix is to produce algae for biofuel production as well as uh, using the waste glycerin for the DHA production, which is a, which is a closed-loop system. Okay. Well, you know, being from the biofuels industry, we know that permitting is never far away. Is there any type of permitting that one needs to start producing algal oil? I'm sorry, but, uh, one more time. I was saying, is there any type of permitting that one needs to be aware of for the production of algal oil? None whatsoever. LG okay. is uh, classified as a uh, marine product, same thing as fish, shrimp, and everything else that comes from the ocean since it's marine. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, no restrictions or uh, permits required for the uh, growing or harvesting or uh, sale of algae products. Okay. Well, as we all know, algae is a living organism. Let me ask mm -hmm. you, do we need to be a biologist to get this business started? Or is this high school science like the creation or the transesterification of biodiesel? What type of knowledge does one need to get started? Uh, growing algae is very similar to having a saltwater aquarium. Is what you're looking at is the optimal temperature for algae is 68 degrees, even though normally you're looking at com uh, human comfort temperature, anywhere between 40 degrees and 95 degrees. Uh, algae has got a life, uh, it's got a shelf life if harvested. Uh, of 60 days refrigerated, so you're not killing the algae. It just goes into, uh, uh, call it a suspended animation uh, when it's cool. It just does not grow or uh, degrade. Uh, as far as the pH, pH is anywhere between 8.2 and 8.4. Same thing as a saltwater aquarium. And the salinity is 26.9. Once again, same thing as a saltwater aquarium. So if you can grow, if you can keep from killing your saltwater fish, you can grow algae. Okay, well said, well said. You know, when you look at the raceway pond versus the closed bioreactor, you know, cross-contamination for raceway ponds is always an issue. Can you talk or speak a little bit about that, cross-contamination and preventing that with your new algal oil business? Sure. Uh, raceway ponds uh, are, are a very good way to get large quantities of algae growing at one time to prevent uh, uh, cross-contamination. Uh, they have uh, raceway ponds that are made of uh, uh, polyurethane uh, tubes, uh, 24 inches in diameter. And they are the same 100 to 150 feet in, in length. And uh, you are still uh, using it in a raceway pond con configuration uh, with the flow going down one way and then coming back the other to be recirculated. OK. So you know, this is a living organism. You mentioned that there's a temperature range that it needs to be in, also a pH range. Talk about nutrients. What does the nutrient level need to be for this algae to grow properly? The nutrient level need to be right. The uh, the algae nutrients uh, there there is a very specific uh, uh, set of nutrients. It is called uh, F two, uh, which is a scientifically designed nutrient base that all the laboratories and uh, uh, algae farms use. Uh, F2 means it's, it's half the strength of F1 solution. And uh, if anyone looks up F2 solution for uh, algae food, you can actually see the, the formula for it on, on the internet. OK. So it's a very specific formula that one needs to be adhered to to create the algal strain. Now, Correct. you know, part of the biggest problem that's been in the formation of the algal industry is really 
the harvesting of the oil, you know, killing the oil, uh, the use of lots of water, I mean, excuse me, killing the algal, uh, the mature algal strains, basically. Uh, do you recommend harvesting all the algae and, and re-inoculating, or do you recommend some other type of procedure to actually harvest the oil? Okay, there, there are uh, a couple of different harvesting techniques. Essentially is what you can do uh, is either grow out your algae uh, in seven days and do a complete harvest, or you can take out 20% uh, uh, of your algae weekly and then replace the, uh, the, the uh, uh, media that was removed and uh, then you would uh, uh, keep uh, harvesting on a, on a weekly basis instead of starting new every seven days. And that, and that is just a growing technique. It depends on how, on how uh, the grower is, is uh, actually set up. Okay. Now, I know before, usually if you harvest, then you have to either go to press or try to do some cavitation or, you know. Right. Or, or some other there are, there are, there, there there are several different uh, 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 harvesting techniques. Okay. Uh, the course, the newest one is, is uh, flocculation. And is, uh, what that is is you are passing the algae through a high-voltage uh, field, and is what occurs is that the uh, uh, oh, the outside skin of the algae ruptures and expels the the limpids or the oils, uh, and is what happens is everything floats to the top of of the of the media, and uh, then is all you have to do is skim the top. Of the media for the uh, uh, for the uh, algae oil or lipids, and then is what you're looking at is there are several different devices that will uh, help you with the harvest. Uh, the most recent that I have seen is the uh, uh, is a device that is a conveyor belt that comes up from underneath the algae uh, surface and pulls the algae up along the conveyor belt and uh, uh, dispenses it in a, in a, uh, uh, in a container for, for harvest. And that has been very successful. And uh, uh, they are, they've been able to get a much higher uh, uh, volume of, of production with that particular machine. Uh, after the algae has been harvested, then it's what they do is they run the uh, the harvested algae through a centrifuge. The centrifuge will spin the uh, uh, the uh, moisture from the algae concentrate uh, into the uh, it will remove it, and then it's what you have is uh, uh, the algae oil that is remaining. At that point, the algae oil is ready to either be packaged as a nutraceutical or it, is, it can be dried and pressed for the algae oil for biodiesel production. Okay. Now, is there a current market value that you're aware of? Let's say you went ahead and extracted the lipids and you just harvested the mature algal biomass as well. After you do lipid extraction, is there a value currently of the leftover biomass? Uh, yes, the leftover biomass is uh, has a value as an animal feed. Okay. Now, I'm aware of there's different types of algal, excuse me, algal biomass uh, that's sold within, let's say, our GNC or our local nutrition stores. Can you kind of explain the difference between uh, that and type of algal biomass and that that you may utilize to produce algal oil for biofuel? Sure. 
The uh, algae that we use for uh, for biofuel, once again, is the uh, Nanocorapsis oculata. And the, uh, the algae that is used for human nutrition uh, is also the, uh, the nanocorapsis oculata, in addition to the, uh, uh, in addition to the nanocorapsis uh, gardenia. And uh, that will, uh, is what they do with that algae, is uh, they will run it through a, a, uh, uh, a centrifuge, and then, then is what, then they will uh, uh, take the algae paste and reconstitute it with a with 30 milligrams of, uh, of saline water for a standard uh, dosage. And that is sold for between 30 and 40 dollars for 30 milliliters, which is one ounce. Yes, we, we've covered the initial needs of a person or what they need to have when they first consider creating a business utilizing algal oil. The business plan, which is either to go towards the pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, biodiesel industry, and then that will dictate what type of strain you need to go and obtain, which will also lead to the formation of either the bioreactor or fermentation tank or raceway pond. And then we've talked about actually the growing, the nutrients, and pH that's needed and the temperature you need to keep that algae. And we've even gone into numerous rays to harvest and even some of the different markets. So now that we've got to this point, can you talk about as far as the industry players, are there any big industries as far as the leaders that you would recommend people start looking at? If they wanted to get into the business, whether it's Johnson and Johnson or a large uh, food company, have you looked at that yet, Bill? Uh, yes, it's what you have is uh, uh, we have some some very large algae players. Uh, several of them that have started with biodiesel uh, algae production and have actually shifted their. Uh, uh, their focus from biodiesel production to other aspects of the algae industry, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, you have a large player in Florida uh, that that is uh, uh, made a lot of news at the beginning of the year that they were the first people to uh, make jet fuel out of algae for the Navy. And although it was being made for thirty-six dollars a gallon, the fact is they they accomplished their goals. Uh, you have other players uh, out west in California, to be exact, uh, that are producing that are producing the uh, uh, algae harvesting machine that we talked about with the conveyor belt. Uh, they are also working with uh, uh, the same machine in. Uh, flocculation of the wastewater from the fracking industry in the, in the Dakotas. And instead of having uh, uh, settling ponds for the water, for the mud to settle out, they're actually removing the mud immediately uh, uh, with the same device, uh, with uh, e electrifying the, the muddy water and then pulling out the mud with the, with the uh, uh, with the conveyor pulley or the conveyor belt, uh, you uh, and then you also have the market that is just being that is growing uh, larger every day with the nutraceuticals. Uh, the astaxanthin. We uh, Hawaii is the largest producer of astaxanthin, and Florida is the second largest producer of astaxanthin with. Uh, uh, oil to omega-3 in Fort Lauderdale, the largest uh, producer of astaxanthin in Florida. That's exciting stuff. Well, let's talk about a little bit 
about the everyday need for the production of algal oil and some of the different instances where it might be very useful to everyone within mm -hmm. our community, let's say. You know, here in Florida, we're always trying to find a way to get rid of the algae out of our lakes, streams, ponds, and rivers, not to mention our wastewater treatment plants, Bill. I was personally at a wastewater treatment plant, actually two of them, and they were having a tremendous problem getting rid of the algae that was growing naturally within their retention ponds, and everyone knows that that's a prime medium for algae to grow. It has the nutrient base, and it definitely has the temperature base. Mm -hmm. Has there been any work done with the utilization of the wastewater treatment plants and actually instead of killing the algae, maybe harvesting it for the production of algal oil and increased mass that it might be a higher value animal feed down the road? I am not familiar with uh, waste treatment plant algae uh, products, but uh, they, uh, the algae could be harvested. Uh, uh, with electricity, you know, working with uh, uh, flallocation is the same way as with any other algae. Uh, uh, so if, if there's algae that is growing, it can be harvested and it can be uh, uh, used for oil output. Okay. Well, there was one specific group up in Gainesville, I believe it was, and they were working with the research center at the local college, and they actually built mm -hmm. a prototype to where they were utilizing the wastewater treatment plant and growing algae. Unfortunately, everyone, it was unpublished. So you couldn't get much information even out of the uh, people that were mainly involved with that. But that mm -hmm. is another industry if you are so bold and brazen to go into to help not only you know your pocketbook but your everyday person who, you know, everyone is affected by wastewater. So let's talk a little bit and recap about how one may be able to get more information on growing algae. Uh, Bill, you have a type of classroom setting that you offer, hands-on instruction to actually bring people into the industry and teach them how to grow. Can you speak a little bit about that, please? Sure, we have a uh, class uh, that we uh, pretty much go through the entire uh, LG production process from uh, uh, you, uh, from maintaining a laboratory sterile culture that you would always keep uh, in a sterilized mode uh, for uh, replenishing your your uh, stocks or uh, in case that there was ever uh, uh, a crash of, of any of the ponds, you have a pure culture to start with. And uh, we, we go through uh, laboratory sterile, sterile techniques on how to uh, work with algae and, and, uh, uh, in laboratory settings. And then we go through and work with, uh, with the non-sterile settings, which would be your raceway ponds, your uh, uh, polyethylene uh, tube raceway ponds. And uh, uh, then we go through uh, the techniques of harvesting, uh, techniques of, of determining your actual density of, of algae product. And the most important, is to find is to troubleshoot any any detail uh, any problems that you might be having. Okay, so you're going to go from initial concept to algae growth, and you're going to definitely provide some great information on how to not kill the algae and make it grow. Right. Do you also have any knowledge within this class, Bill, on how to create different types of strains of algae? Yes, uh, the uh, LG Biofuel Research Center is working with an anachloropsis algae, and uh, we are currently uh, at uh, we are we are producing algae lines that are producing uh, three times as much algae as the standard algae. And if you remember, folks, uh, standard algae produces 
one half of a liter of oil per cubic meter of uh, media. And right now, we are at 1.5 liters of, uh, of uh, oil per cubic meter of, of media. And our goal is to take the process up to six times the amount, which will be three, to three liters per cubic meter, which is uh, twice as, uh, twice as, uh, uh, to twice the uh, amount of oil that the that the current uh, uh, product has. Well, great. Can you kind of share with us what type of lipid content those alcohol strains have? Well, the 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 the, the standard uh, lipid content of of nanocorapsis is a half of half a liter uh, per cubic meter of oil. The current uh, the current top producer by the laboratories is 1.5, and which is what we've been able to match with our new strain, and uh, we are hoping to take that from 1.5. Uh, all the way up to three liters per cubic meter of, of, of uh, lipid content. Okay. That's great, Bill. So, also, let's talk about the classroom setting. Is that a one-day class, two-day class? Are you going to keep them there for a week, Bill? How long do you need them? Yeah, it's one day. It's a one-day class. I can... I can instruct everything that needs to be to be known in, in one day. Fantastic. So everyone, we're going to get that information if you're interested in Bill's class here in Florida. It's a great time because, hey, the bugs are going away and it's not as hot as uh, it used to be three months ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's much nicer today. And for those of you in the cold tundra north, you know, you'll see Santa Claus on the beach here in another month or so. So... What we're going to do now is open up the call to questions and answers section. So what I'm going to do is ask everyone if you can, uh, we got plenty of people on the call right now. So if you're on your computer, go ahead and use the chat and you can send the question in. I know Clint has been doing that. And we're going to get some questions from him and everyone else. Now after that point, I'll go ahead and open up the call so we can all speak freely. Please keep in mind uh, the other people that are on the call. We have a lot of folks, so if you have background noise, please mute your phone. So right now, Bill, we got some questions that I have for you from our audience. Clint wants to know, can you comment about the best methods of harvesting and use of, was that separation products after extracting oil? And that's from Clint. Okay. Uh, uh, as far as as far as uh, uh, the, the harvesting of the oil, uh, you, what you have is is uh, two different uh, methods. You can either go directly from uh, the media into a centrifuge and uh, spin the, uh, uh, the the media out of the the uh, the algae. And uh, your your uh, resulting algae paste is is either uh, sold as a nutraceutical, or it is dried for uh, uh, for pressing as uh, you know, for biodiesel feedstock. Okay. All right, Clint. We got that question answered for you. I got another question for you, Bill. It says, "How high is the voltage to flocculate?" Okay, the voltage for flocculation, you are looking at uh, 12 volts. Uh, with, with the electrodes one inch apart, you're looking at 12 volts at uh, about an amp, maybe two amps. Okay. And, the, and, and uh, the, the flow rate at about uh, 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 three gallons a minute. Okay. Now, Bill, is that AC or DC? Uh, that's DC. Okay. Well, great. Now we're going to open up the uh, call lines for everyone. Please keep in mind, everyone, that we have a lot of people on the call. So if you have uh, noisemakers in the background, please mute. If not, I'm going to have to meet you uh, here on my end. 
So I'm going to open up the lines now, Bill, so everyone can have a chance to ask their questions one at a time, hopefully. All right, so everyone, we can hear you. Is there a question out there for Bill? How about you, Mr. Tucker? Bob? How about Jim? Jim, about, you have a question? You, Bob? How about Jim? Jim, you have a question? Well, I, I, they may be a little shy. <laughs> okay. I won't bite. <laughs> this, this, this is Clint again. Okay, can you hear right. me? Yes, Clint. Yeah, yes, okay. I can. I had a question on the classes. Are they only available as a sit-in, or are they available through a webinar-type thing where we can uh, do it online and watch you? I have not put a class together online, although that could very easily be done. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, good yes, suggestion. I have a question. Yes. Sure. What's your name? Uh, Janine, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know about this a lot, but what's, like, what's the difference between the algae you said and the planktonic algae? You can make also uh, uh, oil from planktonic algae? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't quite understand that. I'm sorry, could you re-state re, uh, the question, please? Okay, yes. Like, I found a term on, uh, on the uh, Google, and what's the planktonic algae? Is the same we are talking about? Plan Bill, she wants to know if planktonic algae. Um... Well, uh, it, it's what you have is either uh, autotrophic algae or uh, or uh, uh, basically, your your it's what you have is your autotrophic uh, algae is the cryptocodinium that does not require uh, light for it to uh, to for it to grow. It it uh, is looking for for carbon. And then you've got uh, your phototrophic uh, algae, which is uh, the algae that requires light uh, for okay, growth. That's, in, okay, that's in, the in, one we're uh, in, about. Instead of carbon. Okay. And then the <laughs> and the, uh, uh, the algae that uh, produces nano or the nanochloropsis algae and the uh, uh, homotrichocarpus algae that produces astaxanthin are are both. Uh, Phototrophic algae. Okay. Vale. Is, the cryptic, is the cryptocodinium algae what they're using in California to make oil to produce biodiesel for the Navy? There's a there's a big outfit doing something like that in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, for, for, uh, that's the algae used in baby formula. The cryptocodinium. Right. Yes, that is the DHA oil that is uh, the, uh, that is used for baby formula, and the largest uh, producer of that is out, I think, California. Correct. What What kind of algae is this? I can't remember the name of it, but there's an outfit in California producing a lot of oil to make biodiesel for the Navy, and they're doing it in uh, reactors that don't don't have light. Is that orange uh, oil. Well, if it does not have light, that means it is a uh, uh, is an autotrophic algae, and uh, that would probably tell me that it's the same cryptocodinium uh, algae that uh, that they're using for uh, uh, for the five hundred dollar a gallon nutraceutical. Wow, that's expensive biodiesel. You know, you, you gotta is what you gotta think. Okay, why are you Selling the five hundred dollar a gallon nutraceutical for jet fuel. <laughs> you got a point. Well, right, if you look yeah. at most of the big players in the industry, a lot of them have really gone towards the nutraceutical line for their investors. They have, indeed. That seems to be uh, the nutra nutra nutraceutical aspect of algae production seems to be a higher value product than the. Uh, biodiesel aspect of the of the algae. 
I guess only the American Navy can buy five hundred gall dollar a gallon diesel. <laughs> well, hopefully that'll go down. I don't see that lasting too much longer. Well, what other questions do we have out there from our panel, from our crowd? Anyone? Okay. Well, with that, Bill, I want to say thank you. Are there any tips and tricks that you can give to people before we part ways to help them get started? Well, algae is very easy to grow. A lot of folks with swimming pools can attest to that. Uh, uh, working with algae is very much like working with a saltwater aquarium. It is not hard. Uh, thousands of people have got saltwater aquariums. Uh, producing algae is just doing it on a, on a larger scale. And uh, 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 other than that, it's just a matter of harvesting and uh, and packing your end product. I've got one more question. If you have time to answer it, sure. Go ahead. All right. I, I'm I'm really working hard trying to do indoor cultures of five gallon quantities of chlorella, and mm -hmm. I notice I notice sometimes my uh, my cultures as they get old start turning brown and if I pull the brown water off and put fresh water uh, they go back to green again. Have I got contamination or is that just stuff dying off or what? Well is what you're looking at is all algae needs to have room to grow and uh, it kind of sounds like if you're growing it in your five gallon fields and uh, uh, if you are not harvesting uh, enough of the algae, there, there is not the, the, the room for, for the growth. And that's why when you, and you'll get what's called a, uh, a crash. And when you add your fresh uh, water or medium, that uh, gives the algae room to grow, and that's when you see it refreshing. Okay, so I, it's just, the brown is just uh, dead algae. Yes. I mean, it, it's it's clear. It looked like clear brown water, but uh, I didn't know if that was like metabolic products of the algae or or what the heck it was. No, no, that that's just the the uh, the old dead algae, and uh, you can prevent that by harvesting 20% of your algae every week, putting in fresh uh, media or water, and right. uh, that should prevent that from occurring. Well, my algae never gets to the point of pea soup. Is it supposed to look like that when you harvest it, or is it supposed to not look like pea soup? Okay, your algae is going to need uh, uh, two things. It's going to need a carbon source, in addition to you know, which is its food, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the room to grow. Uh, your carbon source, the easiest thing for you to use is uh, 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 as opposed to baking soda, which is uh, uh, bicarbonate of soda, sodium bicarbonate, is what you want to use is sodium carbonate. And that is easily available at your local uh, pool supply store. That will be your pH down. OK. And but. I guess my question was, how do you know when the algae is ready to harvest? What what's the what's the opacity? Is it like pea soup, or is it still sort of emerald in color? You know, I'm not familiar with your specific species of algae, and I'm just the, uh, you know, some, out. some algae does not uh, uh, get as thick as as other algae do. Uh, yeah. but I can tell you that. With with uh, aeration, you know, with uh, with your uh, aquarium pump, uh, and, and I'm talking specifically about a five gallon container. Your aquarium yeah. pump uh, producing uh, uh, lots of aeration. In addition to, uh, in a five gallon bale, you would want to put in approximately five to ten grams of the calcium uh, or uh, uh, carbonate uh, uh, on a daily basis as well as uh, give it plenty of illumination. And that should uh, bring you to your uh, fullest or your densest uh, 
of, of capacities. All right. So it should be pretty opaque, though. Oh, yes. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, everyone, we appreciate your time. Uh, you're going to go ahead and have the opportunity. We're going to email everyone information about getting involved in the class, if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, or you can email me directly. It's Victor at 70 cents a gallon. I want to thank Bill so much for your time, sir, and everyone else that is My pleasure. Us. And this call will be available for download uh, via our website. Just take a look at the blog section on 70 cents a gallon, and we should have that up uh, next week during the beginning of the week. So thanks, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.